at the youth level, at the high school level, at the collegiate level, and the professional level. And that's this concept of hypermasculinity, of this pressure cooker that young male, black male student athletes are in as they go throughout their sport journeys. And so today, gonna to be addressing this topic, but figured it would be best to tell it through a story. I wanted to share a story of uh, some young men as they go through their sport journey. It's easy to think that masculinity is shaped as a college student on the biggest stages with all eyes on you. That's when you become a man. But actually, what research tells us is that masculinity and identity are shaped as an adolescent. And male role models, AKA coaches, have tremendous amount of influence on shaping behavior. But the greatest driving force is the relationships that you're building with the kids. I don't wanna let the team down. I don't wanna let my staff down. I don't wanna let our kids down. I don't wanna let our student trainers down. I don't wanna let the cafeteria workers down because they care about what happens on Friday. We want to provide for others. We want to proclaim who we are and protect our own at all costs. And we want to win. And we want to win big and have fun while doing it. We love the lights. We love the stage. That's what we were bred to do. But somewhere along the way, the rules change. Barriers get crossed. It becomes more about winning than remaining true to ourselves. Tony Brown, the pressure seven. begins to mount. Who we are seems to become lost. It was an unnecessary block, and he puts his team in tough. Yep, that's who he was. He wasn't going after the officials. He was going after Brown. But we pay that no mind. We're men. We go back to work, and we do what we've always done. And we grind, and we grind, and we put it on social media, and we have fun, and we're gonna enjoy our time, because that's what men do. But that deeply rooted pain, that deeply rooted pain, eventually, <laughs> eventually can cause us to reach a breaking point. We're not sure how to channel that. Our sense of, of masculinity is, can, can be confused. This environment we're being shaped in. We care, we care so much, but sometimes it just comes out. It doesn't become fun anymore. And I'm not gonna get punked. Don't let me get punked on TV. But at the end of the day, I do it because I care. And I care so much. I care so much. Today was when all the work paid off and, you know, God put me in a position and I just try to take, take advantage of my opportunity. First off, I, would just, I just want to say thanks to Coach Bailiff because that man right there gave me a chance when no one else wanted to give me a chance. <laughs> this is my only Division I offer <laughs> and uh, I broke my leg my senior year of high school and no one <laughs> Everyone sold me off, and uh, that bear right there stuck with me. <laughs> to have Coach Babers believe in me, this just means a lot. You know, Coach Schaefer brought me in here originally. Oh, all I want to do is compete. But it all starts here, and it all starts here from a very young age. And so, like I said, I wanted to engage uh, in a conversation today about this topic of hypermasculinity. Where did it come from? And I figured I would start with my definition of where I came from. This is me, actually my second year, my second year of Little League football. Not my first year. My first year, I smiled in that photo. And my mother was proud, but my coach wasn't. He said, Jerry, you're soft. Why would you smile in your photo? So you better believe, year two, I came back. I had to let him know. I had to let him know. I'm not playing. I had to have this exaggeration of stereotypical male behavior. Go ahead and scroll for me. 
And so we're in this pressure cooker. Keeps growing as you go. We're in this pressure cooker. We're seeing coaches get fired, new coaches jump. Uh, University of Houston, uh, pray for Coach Dana Holgerson. He better go 10 and 2. I hope he goes 10 and 2, or you might want to pack your bags. And now with the new NCAA transfer rule, uh, athletes are allowed to pack their bags too. Where autonomy and choice, while it's a blessing, can also be a curse if not channeled in the right direction. So go ahead and keep scrolling, please. Obviously, there's been extensive coverage about the University of Maryland and everything they're going through. Uh, not here to point fingers, a tragedy that happened to Jordan McNair. Not here to say they did this wrong or, you know, he said, she said. What I'm saying is they're good young men at that program. They're good coaches at that program. But somewhere along the line, things got skewed. Go ahead and scroll. And so we really wanted to find out what are, what are young men's definitions of masculinity? Where is this coming from? So we interviewed uh, 20 Division I uh, black male student athletes uh, in track and field, football, basketball, baseball, hearing their thoughts. When it came to masculinity, it became a status that you have to earn. I'm re not relying on anyone but myself. It's me, I have to do this. I put the picture of the dumbbells there. One young man said, when I don't know what to do or where to turn to, I just go to the, to the weight room and get a quick pump in. I said, okay. Another young man said, if I didn't come across as masculine in the locker room, I'd probably get made fun of, I would get clowned. And so again, this pressure cooker, we're in, this is the context that young men are being developed in. Go ahead and keep scrolling. And so this theme, this theme is that it's acceptable to be emotional. It's acceptable as long as it's in the prescribed context of, of what we're doing. Does that make sense? Go ahead and scroll for me. And so we're very quick to blame these coaches. We see it, we're very quick to blame that. And so in order to take a real objective look at this concept, we, we wanted to interview coaches as well. So we interviewed five division one uh, football, basketball coaches, and the, the, the findings were very interesting, very interesting. I spent a year as a coach myself and can really empathize with some of these responses, saying that, that a lot of times we can't be phased by external things. It has to be very internal. We have to protect ourselves at all costs. I, I, I don't want to be that guy who leaves the office first. Where you, if you think masculinity is, is, is heightened in the locker room, go into a coach's meeting room. Go into a coach's meeting room. You better bring your, your, bring, bring your stuff because I don't want to be that guy who leaves first. One coach uh, he even said that he had uh, turned to Adderall so he could stay focused on the job. This is a coach now, because he didn't want to lose his job. He didn't want to lose his job. And so these men that we sometimes have a, a, a chance to blame are also in the same pressure cooker themselves. And so this theme of I'm, I'm going to disregard myself disregard my well-being in order to receive this validation or out of fear. Different themes that emerged during these interviews. Go ahead and scroll for me. And so what, what are the implications? What does this mean? What does this mean? And so there, there's tr already a significant amount of coach training out there, but at the institutional level, what are we doing at the institutional level? You can go to a session like this, but this isn't every day. What are we doing on the day-to-day -day basis for our coaches who again are the main stakeholders? We can point to the research showing that coaches are main stakeholders in our young athletes' lives. What are we doing for these coaches? We have a mental health round table for our athletes, but do we have it for our coaches? How can we be more intentional about these conversations? How can we engage, coach, how are you doing? How are you? Instead of just great win. <laughs> they wouldn't be there if they weren't winning. I'll just tell you that. How can we be intentional with our coaches? How can we teach them to model? And again, I'm very passionate about this because we can teach our young men and women but until we teach and train those who are investing the most in them, we're not gonna see exponential results. And I know that's a very bold statement. It's a very bold statement. But a lot of the times I think we, we think that it's gonna be us. We're gonna be the ones who change. I think that is true. But how can we continue to supplement that? How can we enhance that? How can we add on that by those who are already doing it? And help them understand this framework in a language, go ahead and keep scrolling, please, in a language that, that they are going to understand. You look at self-determination theory and, and, and social contextual conditions, creating it in a way that a coach is going to get it. That's, it's a fancy way of saying that. Does that make sense? And I'll leave you with this. Go ahead, last slide, please. I'll leave you with this. There are those who have, have done it right, and they focus on things that don't necessarily show up on the scoreboard. One of my favorite quotes, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. You talk about measurement systems and, and frameworks, everything like that. In times of, of change, in times of transition, some build shelters, 
Others build windmills. How can we be a windmill today to our coaches who are already investing in our student athletes?